Shalom and uh, praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you all uh, online students for joining class this morning and uh, also like to welcome our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on and uh, to all our um, bright, handsome and beautiful <laughs> in-person students. Um, okay, thank you all for joining class. Hope all of you had a good Sunday and a uh, good, powerful worship experience at church and a good learning experience. And we'll continue our learning experience this week. Okay. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer quickly? Sri Radha will pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. And uh, when we came here together and uh, we are learning from your word, you give us the wisdom, knowledge, and uh, uh, bless us through Selena, ma'am. We surrender all our students into your hand and Selena, ma'am, into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sri Radha. So um, last Monday, we, before we finished class, we were looking and we were studying chapter 5, Kingdom Living. Okay. And we were looking at some of the characteristics of uh, kingdom lifestyle. Okay. So what are some of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle? Righteousness, joy, and peace. Endurance and suffering. Holiness, holiness and reverence. Okay. Power and authority. Stewardship, being good stewards. Yes, Lina. Forgiveness. Okay. Anything else? No partiality. Yes. Extending forgiveness. Okay. Thank you. So we look at the characteristics of uh, kingdom lifestyle. Okay. Uh, we look at two more. I think we are left with um, two more. No partiality and we finish no partiality, readiness for the king and being celibate um, for the king's sake. Okay. So we look at um, the readiness for the king and we'll uh, read Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13. Okay. So can one of you please read that? Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to those to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So... Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ told us this parable concerning the kingdom of heaven to teach us what? What do you think this is teaching us about? Okay, to be ready when the king comes. Okay, uh, when Christ returns to be ready to always be in a constant state of readiness. Okay, so it's not just being ready like... Okay, it can happen whenever, but we always be in a constant state of readiness for the king to come. Okay, so one way of applying this parable is to understand that our lives um, and our works, our actions, our lamps, 
Okay, so one way of understanding this parable is to look at our life and our works, which means all the things that we do, uh, our ministry, you know, whatever uh, kingdom assignment that God has given entrusted to us, whatever kingdom purposes or whatever we are engaging in the world, our lives, who we are, okay? We are to be the light of the world, okay? So our lives and our works, you know, is is uh, is like the lamp, and we are called to be the light of the world. Matthew chapter five verse fourteen, and our works, everything, our good works that we do, you know, the ministry, the things that we do for uh, His name's sake, or uh, what we do for the kingdom's sake, or the kingdom uh, assignment, is a way people see His light shining in and through us so when we are engaging in our works we're just seeing the 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 life of jesus just flowing in and through us okay we are his light shining before them and when they see the light in us they're actually we are bringing glory to the father okay we are glorifying our father who is in heaven matthew chapter 5 verse 16. So it's very important that we ensure that, you know, we keep our lives and our ministry always radiating with the, the light of his glory, which means we are always manifesting his glory continually until Jesus comes. So that is what is the, the semblance of the light. Okay, So the lamp is our lives and our works that we do. The light is the glory that we are manifesting in and through our lives and in and through um, the work that we are doing for God, okay? So how do we keep uh, ensuring that our lamps are always burning with the oil? So what do you think the oil resembles? Yes, the oil, it, it resembles the life, the presence, and the anointing work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so without which, you know, um, we ourselves, we cannot do good works. We cannot live a life that is holy and pleasing in God's sight. We cannot be light. We cannot be salt. Uh, we cannot manifest his glory in our own strength. So we need to ensure that every day, you know, this oil is continually being filled in us. Okay, so how do we ensure that the oil is continually being filled in us? How does the oil get filled in us? The oil resembles what? The life, the work, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do we ensure that, you know, this life, this oil is always there in us? Prayer, yes. Yes, reading and meditating on God's word. Praying in the spirit, okay. What else? What's the most important thing for God? Love. Love? Obedience, yes. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So having an intimate relationship with him is very, very important, which includes praying and reading God's word and also obedience. Okay. So kingdom living calls for a life of constant intimacy with God uh, to keep our lives and our ministry shining his light until he comes. Okay. And how can this light be shining in us? through our personal times with God, intimate times with God, and also through his obedience, okay? And then another characteristic of kingdom living is celibate, being celibate for the uh, kingdom's sake. Matthew chapter 19, verses 9 to 12. Can somebody read that, please? Um. And I say, uh, Matthew uh, 19, 9 to 12. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife ex except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is uh, divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is a case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, all cannot accept the saying, but only those who to whom it has been given. For there are uh, eunuchs who were born <clears throat> thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs for by men, and, <laughs> and there are eunuchs who 
have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Amen. So here the term eunuch is, uh, you know, is talking in the context of somebody who's not married, who's celibate, okay, who's single, not yet married. And it's not talking about eunuchs in the sense of somebody who's gone, uh, undergone some physical change, as is commonly we understand, okay. So it's not somebody who's gone through some physical change like we commonly understand. But here in this context is talking about somebody who's single, unmarried, and who's being celibate, okay. So he's saying here that there are some people who are unmarried. Why? Why? They have no desire to get married. They just love to be single. They enjoy being single, okay, and doing, living their own life. Then why else are people single? Because some of them, you know, uh, uh, because of uh, men means, you know, some form of social, religious context they are in or, you know, that requires them to be celibate or, you know, because of other influences or they're compelled, you know, just to take on celibacy. Some life situations, some life, you know, challenges that they face and because of people around them causes them to be single. And what else, why else do people remain single? They don't find the right person, okay? Maybe that comes in the second category. Yes, thank you, Rin. So some of them want to just serve the Lord, build his kingdom, just invest all of their time, their uh, life, their, uh, you know, their energy into just building God's kingdom. And, uh, you know, those who choose celibate lifestyle because uh, for, this, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And Paul was one such example. He had every right to choose a wife, uh, take a believing wife, but yet he... Yes, he refused. He gave up his right for the sake of preaching the gospel. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, verse 15, and verse 16. So that he could serve God without any distraction. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. Okay, so there are some people who choose this lifestyle of being celibate or being single because of various reasons, but some of them do it because they just want to serve the king. They just want to serve the Lord without any distractions, without any disturbance. Okay. So that is um, uh, one of the last aspects of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle. Okay. So we looked at various characteristics of the kingdom lifestyle. And I uh, hope that even as we went through all of these characteristics, this becomes our own characteristics, our own lifestyle, our own culture that we live by. Okay. Any questions on chapter 5? Online students, anyone has any questions, any doubts? Ma'am, about this thing of uh, actually they are uh, just being like that. Uh, so Sorry? Just, just not being married. And okay. All. So like uh, in the last time also when we are uh, in the subject uh, found no, no huh? fulfilling God's purpose. So we, we spoke about this like uh, someone asked like uh, is it as a God purpose of uh, being like that. Then you said like... Uh, no, God will, God will, I mean, God uh, orchestrates one person and orchestrates his life or someone's life, but it's their wish to just married or not to be married. So how can we see that? Is, is there any God's plan in our life like that? I mean, just he, he definite, is he definitely arrange a person for us or, or is it a God's will maybe being alone? Uh, to be single. Yeah. You have to take the mic. Hmm. Paraphrasing uh, his hmm. question, like last time when we asked to be single and uh, to be single, uh, you told like if it is God's will, like 
it's hard uh, without the calling to be single and uh, sorry it's hard without the calling like, to be single yeah like to yeah uh, calling to be single yeah. is hard so you don't like we have to ask like if it's god's calling us to be single so then he will give the grace yes so uh, question is, is it so but how we know it how do you know whether god has called it to be single or to be married or Mm. So, I mean, in God's will, once you, when you, when we are talking about this fulfilling God's purpose, then we spoke about this. Like, uh, uh, see, uh, if 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 God is God, don't want us to be single, or uh, like that. God will arrange one person for us, but it's our free will to get married. So, one of uh, maybe it's Francis, I think so. Ma'am, is there is there someone God arranged a, a girl for me? Hmm. But but what if we won't marry it? So what you told is uh, it's it's not God's doing something and all. It's our will to get married or not. Hmm. So is is in the second in the second point hmm. is there any God purpose or will being a, a single? Is it God? Uh, does God call us to singleness? Yeah. Uh, is is there anything like that? See, uh, what scripture tells us is that, you know, um, uh, that God has, um, you know, that he, that he wants all of us to, be, family is part of God's plan and will. We see that in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Okay? He wants, uh, you know, us to be companions, to be together. And he created man for woman. Okay, So there is a plan of God in establishing families and through that, you know, to extend his kingdom as well. So it is God's plan, yes, for us to get married. Okay, But some of us can choose to stay single like Paul. He had every right to choose a wife, to take a believing wife. But he chose not to wife for the sake of the kingdom of God. Okay. And so your other question is, does God have a specific person for us to get married? Yes, God has a plan and purpose for our lives. He knows, he orchestrates things. He knows who he wants us to, you know, to be a life partner. So what if we don't choose that person? If we don't choose that person, then... You know, it's not that God is going to get angry or upset with us and we're not going to get married. He can, and if it does not work out, he can, he will always bring somebody else into our lives. Or if the other person is not ready, is not away, is not willing to get married, then, you know, God has given us the free will to choose. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, they had a free will to choose. They chose what was wrong. They faced the consequences of that. So, uh, uh if 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 we don't choose that and that other uh, or if the other person we know it the other person is god's will for our life and the other person is not ready and not willing and we're waiting it does not happen it does not mean that you know that we're going to be single the rest of our lives because um you know we've lost out on god's will and and it's not my mistake it's other person's mistake but god will always orchestrate do things to bring somebody else into our lives or you know it's just the choice and will of the other person or maybe God can even change the heart of the other person and, and bring them so I really <laughs> so I hope I answered that question or no we told us from Genesis 1 and 2 hmm. uh, God orchestrated and uh, uh, God wanted we as to be a family yes but see oh, I I <laughs> yeah <laughs> not called and all hmm. what what I choose like not to be married is is anything uh, I'll uh, disobey in any way I disobey God's will and purpose you're saying that what if I don't get married is because I disobeyed God's no God's purpose and will. Oh, if you're not you're you're not married, you desire to be married and you're not married, is is it because you are somewhere, you know, going away from God's will? Is there some disobedience in your life or there is some being sin? not married? Is, is there like, is it like is it 
No, if they choose not to be married, it's their own will. Like Paul, we're saying in context of Paul, Paul had every right to marry. He was he was doing he was in the center of God's will, but he chose not to be married for the sake of you know serving God. No, it's not disobeying God's will. No, it's just a choice that you are making, and God is uh, is not somebody who says, "Hey, no, you have to get married to fulfill uh, my plan of family and to move on and things like that." No. So God is not going to be uh, angry with you because you are uh, being single, but you know He will just give you the grace to uh, to live in that singleness so that you can uh, continue doing His will and His plan and His purpose. But if you're saying that. You you don't want to be single and uh, you are not yet married. In that context, are you saying is because of disobedience and sin? No, you're not saying. Okay. Okay. So like Paul's life, you can take the example of Paul's life. Very evident. Yeah. So if you're if you're single just because you want to continue to do God's will and serve Him because you're so zealous and passionate, uh, God is not going to be angry that you are disobeying Him and not uh, getting married and having a family. No. So I hope I answered that question. Okay. Question: uh, Is there a call from what what Prince have asked? Hmm. I mean, see, uh, I just I don't have a call to be single. Like hmm. God don't want me to be single and serve. He want me to use in another way, in another place. But what I wanted to be single and serve. So some of the pastors from I don't mention the ministry. So th this pastor, the senior pastor, is actually a single. So what the remaining uh, assistant pastors also will tell is, I'll also be single because my pastor is single. He did a great ministry. If I sacrifice my life to God, my uh, physical life, all these things, then God will use me so greatly. How you can, how we can see that? The senior pastor has a call. Okay, he is a calling. Pastors. He has a definite calling to be single. Yeah. Okay. But these guys are following the senior pastor, not God. <laughs> like my senior pastor is my pa uh, my senior pastor is single. That's why he built these many churches. So I'll also be single. I'll also <laughs> yeah do great ministry. Maybe they are um, uh, still um, uh, what do you say? Are so passionate and so zealous for God's kingdom that they are so eager to do it. Uh, you know, looking at it in a positive way, and just like their pastor, they also want to you know um, uh, just be serving God. So pastor has set a great model for them in terms of doing ministry and serving God and being passionate for the kingdom of God. That you know uh, that his the other associate ministers have just followed him like that. Uh, but I'm sure if God is, um, you know, um, if that is their desire, then God will let them choose that. But they can even come to a place where they feel that, hey, you know, I'm feeling lonely. I need a partner. They would come to a phase in that. And then God is not going to say, okay, it's time, time's up. You've missed the bus. You know, you can't uh, have a partner. He will provide. He's gracious and loving. So he will just, he's given us a free will to choose. So if they are so zealous and passionate and eager to serve and build God's kingdom, you know, God will just allow them, okay? Because if He puts them in a in a force them into a marriage, they will not be they're not mentally, physically, emotionally prepared for it, you know. So they will the family life will kind of be hindered. So God will bring them to a place of maturity of not maturity of where they will need a family, a desire to have a life partner. And God will prepare them for that season of life and then get them into that season of life. Yeah. Okay. It's just like uh, following the, uh, you know, it's like, um, uh, what do you say? It, yeah, fan following kind of a thing. Oh, you mean the, the Catholic Church, okay, yeah.
See, that is because God has created us to be not single. He's created us to be to be in relationship, in fellowship, in partnership uh, with one another. It's it's how God designed us, wired us, right? Yes, Rin. Pastor, like relating to the single thing, Malay. Uh, what about Peter? I mean, he was married, but it looks like uh, Jesus called him like to be single, right? Did Jesus call him I to be single? Him, like to be out. I know. Like he left his family. No, no. No. Yeah. No, it's calling him to be a Jesus called Peter and the other disciples to follow him, but not at the cost of uh, you know leaving their families. Yes. Following Jesus has a cost where he's saying that, you know, uh, like we studied, you know, um, um, uh, y y y of course, you don't, not that you leave everything and follow him at the extent of even leaving your family. You have your earthly responsibilities, but then that supersedes your calling, your love for Christ. Okay, But at the same time, you don't overlook your responsibilities in your family. So it's not God is not calling all of us to, you know, to love him more and to do his work at the extent of, you know, uh, rejecting our families, take, uh, doing, taking care of our family responsibilities. Like, he, like Paul is writing to Timothy, you know, uh, a soldier is always there pleasing his commanding officer. Okay. He's not engaging himself in civilian affairs. But if a soldier's family has problem, he will go back to his family and he will address the issue he will take care of his family so jesus is not telling us to totally reject and disown and leave everything and just follow him yes there is a cost there is a calling but not at the expense of you know you you leave your earthly relationships then why did god create earthly relationships for us he could have just created us all of us to be single in no families and not get married and uh, you know um, just serve him to manifest his glory. The reason why God created us is also to have relationship and a fellowship with uh, him. That is a characteristic of who we are as human beings. But, you know, we have to have our priorities right. What we saw is fulfilling God's purpose also about this family. Yes. Uh, at what cost? When 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 Jesus called, uh, at what cost we have to leave our family? Yes. So we spoke about all these things. Yes. The cost of serving daily sacrifice, being a living sacrifice. Yes. So, ma'am. Uh, so, mm. as a uh, God will is uh, for all everybody to get. Uh, in relay or uh, to have relationship and to be married you mean uh, okay for everyone it is uh like sovereign will or common will for everyone yeah and also god has specific will or specific plan for someone to be singlehood like god calls some people to be singlehood mm -hmm. like did he choose someone like I have chosen him, he have to be single for me. Is it like that? Uh, I don't know. I must see from scripture where it really says if... I think Paul says, right? In um, He writes in Corinthians. He says, uh, I need to look at it and then get back to see whether he really has called some of us into uh, single. being single. Yes. And there is no scripture like... Yes. To be single. One question is that, like, is there specific calling for people to be singlehood? Hmm. To be. Um, no, he was not supposed to cut his hair, not supposed to drink uh, wine, and not, not touch anything that is unclean or dead. Nazarite vow. So that is the first question. And second question, if it is there, how do we know that God is calling us to be single to serve his ministry? If you how do you know God is calling you to be single? There would 
you would hear very clearly and specifically from God that he wants you to be single and want, doesn't want you to be married. If we are desiring to be single, and uh, is it like God opposes and no, oh, you should not be single? No, I told you he he won't. It's your choice. Uh, he can't force you to to be married. He can't force you to he be single. Suggestions also, no. He gives you the grace. Like suggestion, to... no, it's better if you get married. Like that, he can give suggestions. Start Keep on with it. Yeah. Oh, God might tell you. Yeah, God might tells you through your human reasoning, your human wisdom, your human knowledge, and also through the circumstances and the situations that you go through. And you feel like, hey, it's, you know, I can't stay single. I need help. I need a companion. I'm feeling lonely. So you, and that is one way God is just stirring up your emotions. Or, you know, he's, uh, he's using different circumstances to show you that, you know, but if we are still not going into it, but if we are still stubborn, like, no, I don't want to get married. It's not so stubborn. It's, it's just your choice. Then God is going to give you um, uh, the free will to choose that. And he will give you the grace to live that. And when you come to a place where you say, hey, I don't have the grace anymore, not grace, I don't can't live anymore alone, then he, you pray to him and, you know, he will provide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions on being single, married? Okay, any questions from our uh, online students? You're very quiet. Or any thoughts that you want to say about what people have said so far? No? Okay, we'll move on to the next chapter. Okay, chapter six, Kingdom Culture. Okay. Uh, so we looked at a few aspects of kingdom thinking and we talked about kingdom living as uh, well. So if you we put both of these together, kingdom thinking and kingdom living, what do we get? We get kingdom culture, okay? Because a culture is where people have a specific kind of, um, you know, understanding, mindset, uh, ways of doing things, um, you know, uh, lifestyle, uh, thinking patterns, thought patterns. So we looked at few aspects of the kingdom thinking and we talked about kingdom living. And we put these two together, you know, we have what is called as kingdom culture. Okay. So for if all of us have to begin and walk and think and behave according to the kingdom of God, according to what he has taught us, um, you know, as part of his kingdom, we need to create what is called a kingdom culture. Okay. So this is what, you know, we want to have in our churches. This is what God desires in our churches, in our fellowships, even in our homes, in our families, that, um, that there is a kingdom culture where everyone is thinking kingdom thoughts, kingdom perspectives, king, in the kingdom uh, framework, and also everyone are living according to the kingdom standards, okay? And we'll have a community of people who are experiencing the kingdom culture. Okay, so God wants this kind of culture here in Bible college. He wants this kind of kingdom culture in our churches, in our fellowships, in our Bible studies, in our homes, wherever we go, that, you know, we are um, living according to kingdom perspectives, kingdom thinking, and also our lifestyles are according to the kingdom of God. Okay. So we look at a few um aspects of kingdom culture. We've already spoken about all of these in the past few uh, five lessons, but we will just kind of go through them again and then we will move on to the next chapter. Okay. So as um, kingdom culture, we are all kings and priests. Okay. So are we going to be kings and priests when in the future, it's a future reality or it's a present reality? It's only a present reality. It's both present and future. So how is it a, a present reality? How are we all kings in the present? Where does it say in the word of God that we are kings? First Peter, yes, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are called from darkness into his marvelous night to declare his praises. Okay. Yes, First Peter 2.9, Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 
6, it says he has made us kings and priests to our God. Okay. So here we see that God has already made us what? Kings and priests. We are already kings and priests. When do we become kings and priests? When we are born again. So it's not something that's a future real, uh, re reality. It's not something that is a, you know, a eschatological hope we have, which means it's in a way in the future where we will be kings and priests. But it's also a realized eschatology. Realized eschatology means what? We live it here in the present. We, it's a present reality, something that we uh, experience. Okay. And we are ki kings and priests to whom? to God okay so how are we kings and how are we priests as kings how are we kings okay we are heirs of the king so we are sons and daughters and how else what is our role as a king okay yes we take the authority and power to overcome the forces of darkness we advance against the gates of hell because we have given the keys of the author of authority what else we are part of his inheritance we are here to rule and reign and to extend the kingdom of god in our midst in our sphere in our wherever god has put us okay we are also what priests kings how are we kings we represent the king, right? We represent the king as as a, a prince and princesses. We, res, uh, we uh, children of uh, the king. We represent the king. We represent our king here. We represent his rule, his reign, his presence, his dominion, his power, his authority here on earth. And we're here to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as priests, what is? Uh, how are we priests? We serve God, okay? Offering, yes, interceding, intercede uh, for people standing in the gap also. Yes, worshipping the king. Remember, we the second chapter, we looked at God as king. We are, we are to worship him. And also we have to, as priests, we, we take the matters of the earth to heaven so we interceding and also we seek god's heart or what is his plan and purposes for the people here so heavenly intervention in the affairs and life of this earth or of this people okay so that is what we are need we need to do as priests so you might not have a title as a pastor but that doesn't master matter all of us are priests and all of us are supposed to stand up and you know and do and fulfill our role now being kings and priests is also a future reality okay so how are we kings and priests in the future sorry in the millennium kingdom yes we are kings and priests uh, revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 okay first peter chapter 2 verse 9 okay says we are a royal priesthood we are kings we are priests we, we belong to a holy nation okay so what does the word nation mean the word nation in the greek really means ethnos and ethnos really means a tribe a people group uh, a nation you know uh, it basically means people group or a nation that has the same habit or customs okay our customs our habits in india is very different from the customs and habits from other nations we differ in so much of our customs and the way we uh, do things uh, so it's basically our culture so as kings and priests we are people of a common culture common kingdom culture okay so we have a set of um, beliefs attitudes mindsets thought patterns ethics principles practices that characterize us as children of god as people belonging to the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven okay so when we as a community of believers when we follow kingdom thinking and follow kingdom living you know we create a kingdom culture 
we can we create a kingdom culture wherever we go even if you're traveling in the train you will bring about a kingdom culture because you are carrying kingdom thinking and kingdom living okay uh, even in your home if you're the only believer you can bring about kingdom culture in your workplace you know if you're the only believer you can bring about the kingdom culture so wherever we go the kingdom of god is in us and is advancing through us we need to remember that so just recap of everything that we are uh, looking at okay so we see that um, uh, kingdom culture is a prevailing culture what do we mean when we say that kingdom culture is a prevailing culture it happens what do we mean when we say that kingdom culture is a prevailing culture it is a culture that is dominant okay that is something that is prominent that is prevalent okay so um, when a community of believers truly establish a culture of the kingdom of heaven in their midst they we will see that we will be able to overthrow the culture of the world the the culture of the evil one or um, you know the world that is coming uh, in and advancing against the kingdom of god okay so we will be able to overpower the evils of the uh, the culture that is around us so that is why when people come to church why do we see them transformed or change when not only come to church to our bible study life group or when they relate to us why do we see a transformation in their lives because they they're coming from the world to a kingdom of god where they're seeing the kingdom culture and they're seeing the difference and of course the holy spirit is working in and through their lives and it is the kingdom culture and is the holy spirit that is going to change the culture of the world that is in them so they're saying hey you no know, look at these people they're so different you know i can see righteousness peace and joy i can see joy in the midst of affliction i can see peace in the midst of pain and suffering and there is something different about these people okay so they're going to like our culture they're going to like the way that we are living and it's going to change them and transform them and it's of course the holy spirit that is causing them to see and we look at it even in the uh, various examples in the old testament right in the example of joseph the pharaoh said you have the spirit of god in you how can a, a, a you know a pagan king no you know look at uh, daniel's life okay uh, you know look at uh, even abraham even though he lied he said a half lie but the the kings realized that you know this this man has something really great the power that is in him is really great so you know we we bring in that kingdom culture and the kingdom culture that we have is going to influence the evil that is around us so you know some of you especially those who are e learning students and you know online students you are working in a secular place and you're you're pretty frustrated with all of the things that are happening in your workplace the culture of this world but then you you can know that the culture that is in you that you represent is more powerful is more advancing is more prevalent than the culture that is in the world that is the evil that is in the world and you can you know influence the culture that is around you you can have a powerful influence in the culture around you because god has raised you up to be that he has given you the authority so you can say hey i'm i'm just like a speck in this multinational company so what if you are just a speck in the multinational company but you have a greater power that is working in you a greater culture that is wor in working in you that can transform that can reinforce just imagine a king like nebuchadnezzar you know who is so egoistic so much of pride who says you know when he looks at shadrach meshach and abednego he saying you know he gives honor and glory to their uh, god so even a king like nebuchadnezzar when he can come down on his knees you know what are people in the work culture so we need to um, we need to make sure or ensure that we are living kingdom thinking and kingdom lifestyle and wherever we go we can bring about that kingdom culture 
Okay, but the challenge really is to establish this culture among us as community of believers. Because sadly, if you look at our churches these days, there is no kingdom thinking, there is no kingdom lifestyle. There's so much of the world that has uh, come in. Okay, so the challenge is for us to establish a culture amongst us as a community of believers who will truly function as kings and priests in the kingdom of. God. So when we begin to think and live with kingdom perspective, then we can establish kingdom culture in any part of the world. And wherever we go, we can become a prevailing force that can advance the kingdom of God and we can truly be salt and light in the world. Okay. We look at a few facets of kingdom culture, uh, just a few facets of kingdom culture. Yeah, just one more uh, minute. Yeah. So uh, the first one is a culture of honor. We already looked at it. We already learned that we have to practice to give honor, reverence, and respect. So who do we give reverence, honor, and respect? To our king first, to our king who is the lord of lords, and our god who is the head of the kingdom. Okay. Uh, who else do we bestow honor on? People, okay, fellow believers, and the Bible word of God says we give double honor to whom? Yes, those who lead God's people well, those who labor in the word and the doctrine are supposed to be given double honor. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Okay. So when you honor someone, how do you you know when you honor someone, what are you expressing? You're expressing that you value them, uh, what they mean to you personally. Okay, we'll stop here. It's time. Uh, we'll come back after the break and uh, we'll continue. But is it not like showing partiality? 